This episode is sponsored by Kirkering Barbaria, your trusted partner in tax, audit, and outsourced accounting services. Serving Sarasota, Manatee, and the greater Tampa Bay area for over 50 years, KB helps clients achieve their personal and business goals. Visit kbgrp.com to learn more. Hello and welcome to the Business Observer from the Corner Office podcast. I'm Mark Gordon, Managing Editor of the Business Observer. Today's guest is Paul Soul, CEO of the Florida High Tech Corridor. Paul, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks, Mark. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I look forward to this. Excellent. Me as well. So High Tech Corridor, that sounds very, very prominent and high tech. Tell us what the High Tech Corridor is and what you guys do. And probably what I'll try to do is say it's not just about high tech, but no, absolutely. So it's a 23 county region. Uh, we originally named after the I-4 corridor. So it goes all the way from Tampa, St. Pete, all the way across to the Space Coast. We really converge and catalyze the capacity for this region uh, in the high tech world. And it's for the benefit of the communities. Tech for tech's sake doesn't mean a hell of beans if it's not helping the people that it serves. And so that's kind of how we we approach this uh, in the high tech corridor. Yeah, it's a, it's a wide area. It's still it's 23 counties, right? So you guys are uh, Tampa, Hillsborough, Pinellas, uh, this side of the west coast of Florida, but also through, as you said, uh, the east coast of Florida. Yep. It, it, it literally follows uh, the I-4 kind of north and south. Uh, you pick up the counties uh, and goes all, all the way across. You bet. And what are some of the things that you guys do there? I mean, you work directly with companies. Is it economic development? And, and what else do you guys uh, do? And what's your mission there? Yeah. So, um, so great question. A couple of things that we can dive into anywhere you want. Um We consider ourselves regional ecosystem builders in the world of entrepreneurship and high tech. So what the heck does that mean? We really try to connect, um, convene uh, organizations, small businesses to be able to grow here in in Florida. We have three, our three partner universities are UF, UCF and USF. That's who powers us. Okay. Uh, and then we look at it from a regional perspective. Each of the consider a Switzerland when it comes to the 23 counties. I love right. them all. I love all the schools. Uh, and so we're part of that network of ecosystem builders. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point because so many of these tech, these homegrown tech companies, you know, that, that start with five, 10, 15 people, not so many of them, but some of them get to, you know, a thousand employees, you know, take ReliQuest in Tampa that, uh, you know, started virtually with just six people in a room, basically. Yep. And I think there are over 3000 employees now, several thousand. So those yep. are kinds of the companies you guys work with there. That we do. And, and really, it's that for me, what gets me up every morning is thinking about that person with the idea uh, that's going to solve a major problem. And all they need is a little bit of help in who to connect with, what to do next. Um, they have they have the insight. Uh, they have the motivation. Uh, now it's just to help them. And the beautiful thing about the corridor is that there are a ton of organizations out there that we work with and yeah. work together with for, for that purpose. Awesome. All right. So you have quite an interesting background. Uh, MIT is in your background, Stanford and the Navy, 33 years in the Navy. Tell us some of the highlights of uh, start with the Navy. Tell us about that and kind of what what roles you had there. Yeah, so um, I'm very blessed to, to have served 33 years. I never thought of it as a career. Um, I actually graduated from MIT with an aero engineering degree, not wanting to be an engineer. Uh, and I was lucky to be Navy ROTC. And and so they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, could I fly those fast jets? Would that work? And, and that's kind of been the high... It, it's what's happened to me all along. These opportunities kind of pop up. So uh, started flying, uh, loved every second of it. Um, again, never thought of it as a career. So they kept offering me opportunities uh, to keep going. Spent yeah. uh, time in the operational Navy, spent time in the test and evaluation world, went to test pilot school at Pax River. Always wanted to be an astronaut, never quite made it. That that's okay. Um, yeah. I have friends who are up on station right now, so that's uh, I love I loved it. 
that's that's pretty cool. So then you could just you know, what do you want to be when you grow up an astronaut? You almost you almost got to live that. that that's right. And now I just live vicariously through folks like Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore and Reed uh, Wiseman and and the ones that I have known who are true American heroes. Uh, as we continue in that world of space. It's amazing. I, this is years ago. I mean, I've been to to uh, Cape Canaveral several times, but several years ago, it's probably about 10 years ago, and I went with my son's uh, Cub Scout troop, and yeah. I thought it was such a great trip to be with those kids in that environment. And um, at the time, I think they still do this. You could, like, have lunch with an astronaut. That was a very cool part of it. Was, I don't know how much yeah. the seven- and eight-year-olds loved it. I loved it, but um, yeah. very cool yeah. part of NASA. And, and um Kennedy Space Center there. And one of the things I've seen with those astronauts is they relate to the eight-year-olds and they relate to the 88-year-olds. Yes. Um, for, for sure. It, it's yeah. just, there. there is a whole new, I mean, the stuff, I just hope I live long enough to see some of the things that we're going to do in, in space in the future. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Okay. So you're in, you're in the Navy, you're working way up and, and uh, there's, you know, a lot of leaders that you come across and you became a leader yourself as you you know, grew into your career, what, what are some leaders you admired and what did you admire about them in, in the military, in the Navy? Yeah. And I, and, you know, I've been thinking about this one um, because I think, I guess my, my vision of leadership has changed over time and, pr and probably rightly so, you know, when you start out as a young Lieutenant, you look at your, your first commanding officer. One of my first ones was a, a guy by the name of Dan Clarkson. Beast was his call sign. We go by call signs in the Navy. Sure. Uh, and, and Beast was just an amazing, bigger than life person that I still am friends with. And, and so you realize that all these people are there to really support you. Um, the, I guess the thing that I think most of in, in leadership is um, you really got to be yourself. Um, I, th as I think about um, what makes me – and I, I'll be honest, I, I don't think of myself – leadership doesn't come to the top of the list when I think of myself – I am more interested in learning something new every day and really giving back. That's kind of where I am in, in my life because yeah. of the benefits of what the Navy's done. So, yeah, you have those you have those leaders that are out there uh, on the pointy end. You know, we're going this way. And I've been blessed in the Navy to have some great civilian leaders and some great acquisition and test and evaluation leaders who are dealing with really complex problems and being able to get to solutions. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been blessed with, with all those, uh, all those kind of folks. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, so beast. Okay. What was your call sign? So, uh, this will take more of a podcast. My call sign was LJ, uh, the two letters. Right. Um, it had started out as lips, um, one of the things that happened was after test pilot school, my next set of orders was in China Lake, California, where um, if you're familiar with the high desert, we do a lot of testing. There happened to be another Lips there. He was much senior to me. Great right. guy, Doug Henry. Um, and we were all fine. We could have the same call sign until we flew together. And then I got everything messed up because we were responding to the same commands so he brought me down into the ranch where the test pilots were, and he said, uh, Paul needs a new call sign. And I had been in the Navy probably seven or eight years, and I said, oh, no, this is going to be the worst. I'm going to get right. stuck with something. And Tom Hoff Hoffer, uh, bless his heart, said, let's just make this easy on Paul and call him Lips Jr. So L I'm LJ, Lips Jr. There is a senior, a Lips Senior Lips, who uh, fishes in Idaho right now, and we're great friends as well. That's awesome. Well, and LJ sounds good. It does. It does roll off the tongue. It does, um, and that's part of the deal. You got it's yes. got to roll off the tongue. You yes. know, it's got and it worked out. It worked out fine. Yes. So you said you don't think of yourself as a leader, but, you know, you're the CEO of an organization that stretches, as we talked about, you know, Tampa to Daytona and all these different things. You know, what do you enjoy about that part of it? You know, what do you enjoy about being a leader? Yeah. So, um, 
I guess I'll take it all the way back to as I left the Navy and, and people go through these transitions. Um, in fact, I think more and more, uh, more and more people are, oh, I like this job. I'm doing this. Now I'm going to shift over there. And so I, I really leaned on a lot of mentors as I left the Navy. And and one of the things that several of the mentors said were, number one, don't rush the journey. Um, take your time to understand what's inside you because often in the military and God bless our sailors and airmen and soldiers and Marines and coast guardsmen. And um, because very often we're doing in the active duty force, what our leaders want us to do, not necessarily what we want to do. And so taking a little time off and, and Mark, I'll tell you, it was it took about six months of figuring out my two guideposts, which is I wanted to be able to give back. I wanted to be able to learn something new every day. And then the opportunity for this thing called the corridor. I got a call and from a search firm and they said, hey, do you want to apply? And I said, who are you and what is yeah. the corridor? And so now as I studied it more and more, I said, oh, this would be like the coolest. And it, and it has been for the last yeah. four years, just been been fantastic. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, don't rush things, trying to figure it out. Um, Because especially in the military careers, go, 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 right? It's always the next task, the next, even if you're not at combat, obviously, there's a lot happening uh, to be combat ready. Uh, and, and very and very often you're told what to do. You, yes. you don't have a choice, right? So now it's really weird after 33 years to go. Wait a minute, I've I've got a choice. And so you start asking people. I asked my wife, you know, yeah. and and, and uh, family, and and so yeah. So it's it's a different position to be in for sure. Yeah, civilian land. You've been yeah, there. right, you know, right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> definitely. So what? On the flip side, what are some of the more challenging parts of being a leader for you personally, and how have you addressed those challenges? Yeah, so um, a great question. I'll I'll relate it back to, because I think as as individuals in organizations, you can learn from leaders who you feel are successful, and you want to kind of be like them. You always need to be yourself, but you kind of be like them. And then on the flip side. Sometimes, and I ha- I think everybody has those yeah. those jobs uh, where it's like, who my my boss and I, we did not see eye to eye, and it was my it was my it was my fault. I couldn't understand how to give her the things that she needed. Yeah, and um, I, I was trying, so I, I sort of have taken that to the corridor because I don't. This is not a world that I'm familiar with. I'm getting yeah. familiar with it. Right. But you have to allow people to be able to share their stories and what they're doing. So that entrepreneur that's out there, uh, Johnny Crowder is one of my heroes and he was yes. on your podcast. Yes. I got to judge him being a, being a pitch. He was in a pitch competition like three years ago. Yeah. And, um, and you talk about a guy who, an amazing person. And I look at him and go, man, this is, this is to be a part of that and support those kinds of entrepreneurs is great. Yeah. Johnny Crowder, uh, previous guest, as you mentioned, he was, he's just such a dynamic person. I mean, I think there was a box of cereal behind him and I said, what is that cereal? I mean, it might even have been off camera. I don't remember now. And he, he was excited talking about cereal. Like the guy, he's just an energetic, excitable person. Yep. Yep. And you brought up something interesting. I interviewed for a story. This is years ago before people were podcasting, but he was, uh, I have to think of his name. He was a nuclear submarine captain in the Navy, Ooh. retired, um, and he moved to Sarasota. And he wrote a book called Turn the Ship Around, and it was about um, he had come into a ship that was not was underperforming. Yeah. And people had told him, like, don't take that job. He did. He turned it around. Yeah. But one of the things he said that really resonates, he, he told me that it was hard for him to come out of the military and start writing a book where it wasn't orders and orders. It was very freewheeling entrepreneurial. So you've dealt with that as well. Kind of finding your place in your career in life after the military. Yeah. And it's very, for me, it's very much a listening and learning journey. Um, I, again, a great, a uh, great mentor of mine who became, who still is, I think the director of strategy for the university of North Dakota system of universities and his his word to me was, Paul, if you find yourself in higher education or supporting higher education, merge into traffic gently. 
Uh, and and I always yeah. remember that it's like be be willing to. I'm a I'm a I'm a Covey trained guy. So and the and the the idea of first seek to understand mm-hmm. and and then to be understood. Resist the temptation to speak first. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I the more senior I got, I learned that paid off so much because. Every, everybody assumes, well, the Admiral has all the answers. Well, yeah. guess what? We don't. And you've got to set the conditions to get those answers out of people, especially news that they think you don't want to hear. Yeah. You have got to hear that stuff. And I think the same thing would apply to an entrepreneur and a small team. Yeah. And they have, they have got to know if this... If the wheels are coming off, I need to know. I need to know that because then you've got runway to be able to to fix it. Yeah, resist the temptation to speak first. I love that. That's so yeah. important for any leader in any organization. You sort of touched on this. I wanted to ask you what's a piece of leadership advice that's really stuck with you. Maybe it was this gentleman from North Dakota, but any anything else? Um, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, no, I think. Um, uh, I think it's that balance of, and I'll put it this way, you you have to be yourself as a leader. So you have to really think through, so who am I at my very core? And what are those, what are those traits? What are those behaviors? What are those core values that I'm going to take to a leadership role? Because I'll tell you what, Navy sailors, they will sniff out a fake in a heartbeat. Yeah. So if you try to play the, the, you know, I'm the Tom Cruise or I'm the what you pick it. If if you try to play somebody else, um, it, it generally kind of falls apart. Yeah. Um, So I, I think that's maybe one thing. And that could be for anybody who's been in, a leadership position. And, and I think it, in the entrepreneurial world, there's so many, I mean, they're just leaders all over the place. Um, I think you have to be true to your core values and, and figure out what those are. Yeah. Spend time doing that. Was it challenging for you personally going into the corridor where, and I want to see how many people, I don't know how many people are on your team, but was that a challenge for you to kind of be yourself in front of these people that frankly, if, if somebody was, if I was working in an organization and somebody came in to take it over 33 years in the Navy, yeah. I might be a little intimidated by this. Uh, yeah. How did you address that? That's a great question. For starters, I started June of 2020. So right at the beginning of COVID. Yeah. So it was all virtual. Right. Um, we had a, we've always had a group of about 10. Um, and so getting through that, and, and I remember, so my co-chairs are the three university presidents for UCF, USF, and UF. And I remember distinctly, again, I, I brought sort of the Navy with me and I said, yes, sir, uh, uh, presidents, I'm going to have a, a strategic plan for you in the next, in the next three months. Oh, three hundred, right. And, yeah. and about a month later, I said, forget what I just said. I don't even begin to understand what ecosystem building and entrepreneurship and yeah. innovation mean? Give me a chance to play in this sandbox. And and again, I'm very blessed to have been given the chance to figure it out because I was I was certainly not not prepared at all um, to 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 be blessed with this opportunity, and I was given enough time to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so your career, um, you know, I think everybody kind of goes through different different setbacks, failures. Um, what's one failure, setback, <laughs> situation that you've learned the most from? Yeah, um, so one of the things we do in naval aviation for a lot of us is we fly off aircraft carriers. That's uh, for a fair number of the types of aircraft. We do other things too, but that's – so bottom line is you got to land on one. Yeah. Um, I, I did fine in the training command with, with training aircraft. I went to fly F-18s. That was my first aircraft that I got to fly and uh, got through training. And the final thing to do is go land on a carrier, this time both in the daytime and then at nighttime. And, and I failed at night. I failed. And I was sent back um, 
uh, in the backseat of an F-18, you talk about a position of shame, you know, it's like, oh, great. I can't even fly my own jet back. And and I really struggled for a few days saying, man, Mike, this all this time and I can't do this. And the and the Navy is in, you know, it's just this great organization where I was given a chance to try again. Yeah. And I think the idea of failure and then get back up and try it again. And I had a did it the next month when every month they go to the carrier with the yeah. with the students under training. And I was successful, um, but it I mean, taught me a lot about, um, and I remember, you know, and when you talk to entrepreneurs, it's the same thing. Yeah. You're going to fail. You're going to miss. You're going right. to go off in there and, and you just got to come back and, and keep at it. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that because like the confidence level, like there's, there's probably what a few hundred people in the world who've landed, maybe more than a few hundred, but not a ton of people have landed a plane on an aircraft carrier. So yeah. like the fact that you could even be in the position to do that is, is impressive to me. What is, when you say fail, I just don't understand that. Like, were you yeah. not able to land and have to circle? Around? Yeah. So no, great question. So one of the things we have is uh, what they call an LSO. Um, right. So a landing uh, safety officer at the back of the ship who is you're following instruments and light uh, the Fresnel lens but he's there watching you to make sure okay. you that if you need to wave off, you need to wave off. And and where I failed was I was unpredictable. Um, okay. So I would do things. I could land, but it made the LSO really nervous. Yeah, now, okay. I probably should have been nervous, too. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know it. Uh, so, yeah. So it's it's and they said we can't. That's the one thing they can't handle is unpredictability. Sure. If you're yeah. if you're starting out low or starting out high, that's yeah. okay. But I was I was unpredictable. Yeah, um, I was I was nervous uh, at night. It is it is a little tiny dot of light out there, and it is it it took me. I had to do some serious soul searching after I I failed, and said, "Do I even want to do this?" Yeah. So you were able to do that and do that soul searching. Obviously, you, you did it. You came back, and that's just amazing, as you said. That's uh, that's a pretty intense landing situation. Yeah. Um, one last question on on sort of mentors and and leaders. You, uh, maybe it's Beast. That's a great call sign. Not that LJ is uh, not a LJ is uh, a good call sign. But Beast, Beast is a great. I love Beast. Everybody who knows Beast is just to have a to have one of your first commanding officers. And what Beast did for us and for our junior officer contingent, yeah. we still get together. Um, it just was tremendous. Yeah, you said big personality. What was he like? What, why was he a key mentor to you? What what yeah. uh, did he do that resonates with you? I, I'll, t I'll tell you a story. Um, so one of the things that we had to do, we would often get a chance to fly on weekends. Um, and to be able to go to various bases because you couldn't get all the training done during the week. And so I took an aircraft. I was given the privilege of taking an aircraft on the road, um, flew it up to uh, Boston. Um, part of it is so South Weymouth used to have a base right there. It was great. Um, thought the weather was fine. Uh, came in to land. Clouds were lower than expected. Runway was wet, which is not a good thing. So you begin to talk to yourself and go, oh, shoot, how did I get myself there? One of the rules is, and at South Weymouth, you have a resting gear there, just like you would on a ship. And one of the rules is, if it's if it's wet, if there's standing water, you drop your hook and take a trap. And I said, well, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to have to call Beast. And Beast is going to say, why in the heck were you landing there when you had to take a trap? And I'm going right. to be done. And I remember calling him and he said, okay the jet okay? And I said, yes, sir, it is. He said, all right, we'll see you when you get back. And I thought, man, the trust that he's putting in me yeah. is, is, um, I didn't, I didn't deserve it. Um, yeah. but it's taught me a lot and it's taught me how to be a better leader when you realize yeah. that people are there doing their damnedest to do a great job. Yeah. And if you can give them that if you can give them that confidence, that really helps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excellent. It's almost like it's parenting too, right? In a way, like when you show your, you know, I have a, yeah. a teenage son and 
you show them that you you trust them even though they made a pretty teenage son stupid decision so um, <laughs> you still trust and with, them. and with three kids two out of college one still in college and it still happens yes. and uh, it is very much like it is very much like parenting you know and as you say that mark that's interesting because uh beast was very much like that he had yeah. that as as a commanding officer and he went on to do great things um very very much hey when it's time to have fun let's have fun when it's time to be serious, we're going to be serious. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just incredibly um, meaningful for me in that, in that environment to have a leader like that. Yeah. All right. Excellent. One last question for, well, really four last questions, but the main last question, what's one thing you would advise people to do that they can utilize to improve their lives? You know, you've done a lot of things in your life to constant improvement, right? What's one thing you would, advise people to do to be better in their life? Yeah. Um, wow. That's a good one. Um, I'll, I'll quote one of my favorite authors, Brene Brown. Um, she was on a podcast or actually, yeah, she was on a podcast a year and a half or so ago. And somebody asked her the question at the end, Hey, what would you tell people? Um, and this really resonated with me. She said, every day, just be a little more curious, be a little more curious about somebody else. And, and I've taken that to heart and it's easy to do in the corridor because there are a ton of people out there that are doing yeah. amazing things because it, I think it keeps, I think it keeps you young. I'm going to be yeah. 62 in a week. Uh, and I feel like I'm about 32. Yeah. Um, and the things that we're doing, um, even in the K through 12 world, being a judge at invention convention in June and, and judging fourth graders doing science projects and they're going to solve the world's problems. Um, you, you, you're scratching your head going, how, how did you come up with that idea? Yeah. And so being, being curious, I, I think gets me, uh, gets me excited every day. Awesome. All right. Well, I said we have four. So it's three, three rapid fire questions we Ooh. end with. Okay. Okay. What is a place on your bucket list that you haven't been to yet? What's a bucket Ooh. list trip you want to take? Yeah. Um, Poland. I'd like to go to Poland. Um, I, I hear stories about it. As a family, we've gone to Italy before. We've gone to the UK. I, I'd like to go to Poland. I think that would be interesting. Cool. Excellent. Who are two people you would like to have dinner with, dead or alive, two people you'd like to have dinner with? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Neil Armstrong, for sure, as, a, as an astronaut. You're going um, astronaut. Neil Armstrong. Yeah, I, a, I would. I would. Way to go. Yeah, I just think. Um, and, and then I think. Uh, I think Mother Teresa would be a very interesting. I've become, as an engineer, um, and my our oldest, Luke, graduated with a philosophy degree from the University of Dallas. And and I'll be honest, when young, uh, when he was thinking about doing that, I thought, what's that going to get done? And <laughs> yeah. and I and I have that typical engineer, right? I was say, the engineering dad uh, was like, uh, are you out of your mind? Yeah, are you really? What do you want to do? And now now he's working, believe it or not, for Goldman Sachs. And and we have had these philosophical discussions. And I think Mother Teresa in what she did in her life um, for the poor in India. Oh, man, that would that would be an amazing visit. It's interesting you say that we had somebody, uh, not the exact same question, but actually a tech CEO in Sarasota, Erin Sigich with Perform CB, uh, internet marketing company. She also has a poem from Mother Teresa on her desk that she uh, that she reads a lot. It's a very inspiring poem to her. Um, yeah. I like it. Okay, last question. How many unread emails do you have right now oh okay so <laughs> we're, just, we're we're on a tuesday morning we're mid tuesday yeah, yeah. morning mid yeah July. so so this may generate another series of questions because as i look at my outlook um 30 so now i know where your head's at right you're going like what on earth um, I will just tell Maybe. you my, my, my view, and, and this is the being old, um, just because somebody sends me an email, doesn't put that in my to-do list to answer it. 
Um, it's the only way, honestly, Mark, that I can survive. I, um, I, I don't, I don't need another Slack channel. I don't. Uh, there's a great book called From Strength to Strength, and and it talks about folks in mid midlife and how you're you're trying to be that youngster who can multitask and do everything, and then you get to a point where you know what. You're going to kill yourself trying to do that, and I'm sort of on that hopping to the second curve, mm-hmm. where it's 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 le- or as David Brooks would say, it's less about my resume and more about my eulogy. I'm I'm more interested yeah. in in sort of legacy and meaningful conversations than than I am in in, in answering emails. Yes. Sorry about that. I'm probably no, a failure. <laughs> Gave, I'm glad I asked it. It gave a great answer. Um, <laughs> thank you, Frank. And maybe I've hit the top of your list of nobody ever has that many. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's the that's the current number. It would be there, but I mean, credit to you. I did uh, uh, email you. Oh, I, I emailed you asking for um, your bio and a headshot. You got back to me, so I, at least I was. Uh, that, I there was, you go. <laughs> I was on the top of the list. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Paul Soul, Florida High Tech Corridor. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a great conversation. Thanks for being on the From the Corner Office podcast. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much for uh, for this. I'm, I'm very blessed, and I look forward to meeting you face-to-face. Absolutely. Me too. Thank you for listening to the Business Observer From the Corner Office podcast. I'm your host, Mark Gordy. This podcast was produced by Reed Corley of The Corley Company in Sarasota. To hear more episodes of From the Corner Office podcast, go to businessobserverfl.com.